had perished Order, in WA. Senator Smith, it being 2 p.m. Um, questions without notice. Senator Chisholm. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. When the Parliament met in June, the Prime Minister arrogantly boasted, and I quote, there is not one person who is in an ICU in an Australian hospital as a result of falling victim to COVID. How many Australians are in an ICU due to COVID today? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, as of the last advice that I have, Mr. President, just looking for this morning's details. President, I'll, I'll have to take that question in the notice. I just don't have the details specifically in front of me today's number of today's epi figures. Senator Chisholm, supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, in June, the Minister for Health told the Parliament that no one catching COVID and dying in Australia in 2021 is one of Australia's great public health achievements. How many Australians have tragically died as a result of COVID-19 in Australia this year? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. Pre Mr. President, um, uh, as of uh, so far this year, Mr. President, uh, we have had um, uh, on the numbers that I have 936 total deaths in Australia uh, for COVID across the entire pandemic. Um, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Relevance. The question wasn't that. The question was this year. You've reminded the minister. Uh, of the question. Um, he has been speaking for 19 seconds. I'm reluctant to say... Uh, have you concluded your answer, Senator Colbeck? Uh, Mr President, um, as at the beginning of this year, there had been 910 deaths. Um, uh, and so that means that so far this year, there have been 26 deaths. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Does Mr Morrison take responsibility for the hospital admissions and tragic deaths that could have been avoided if he had established a national quarantine system and fixed his bungled vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, can I say in relation to uh, the quarantine system that operates in this country, that operates by agreement through National Cabinet by the state. So every time the Labor Party criticised the national quarantine system. They are, in fact, criticising their state colleagues who, under the national health agreement, have agreed to conduct and manage hotel quarantine across the country, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, we continue, as I've said on a number of occasions, to build the number of uh, points available for Australians to access the vaccine, uh, we continue to do that. We continue to build the number of vaccines available to Australians, Mr. President. And um, as of today, we're well in excess of 13 million vaccines that have been administered to Australians across Order, the country. Order, Senator Colbeck, uh, time for the answer has expired. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister advise the Senate on the performance of Australia's Olympic team at the recently completed Tokyo Olympics? The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McGrath for his questions. Mr President, on behalf of all Australians, can I extend my congratulations to our 486-strong Olympic team for their outstanding success and achievements over the last 16 days in Tokyo.
Mr. President, they have allowed us to cheer on from the sidelines, had us on the edge of our seats, united us as a, as a, as a nation at a time when we have never needed it more, Mr. President. Australian athletes are responsible for an all time equal record haul of 17 gold medals, along with seven silver and 22 bronze. Mr. President, can I pay tribute to all of our athletes and also recognise the absolutely enormous efforts of their coaches, support staff, families and friends who, insist, who assisted them to get to Tokyo. Mr. President, can I also pay tribute to the people of Tokyo and Japan, to the Japanese government and to TOKOG for organising the Games. Uh, I pay tribute to the people of Tokyo and Japan for keeping their commitment to the athletes of the world to host what has been without question one of the most extraordinary games ever held. Of course, Mr President, the Games is now something that Australians can, the hosting the, the Games is something now that Australians can look forward to with the successful bid in a, in, uh, last, in the last couple of weeks of the Games for South East Queensland in 2032. Mr President, and now we all keenly await the Tokyo Paralympic Games, which begin on the 24th of August, and I know our Paralympics team is equally well prepared Order. for those Senator Games. Colbeck. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you. What is the significance of Queensland and Australia securing the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm truly proud to say that Australia will host the Olympics for the third time and the Paralympics for the second time after Brisbane and South East Queensland secured the 2032 Games on the 21st of July, following that historic vote by IOC members in Tokyo. Mr. President, the 2032 bid delegation representing all levels of government. Premier of Queensland, the Lord Mayor of Brisbane and myself provided the final presentation to the IOC membership, along with the Prime Minister who participated virtually. It is a fantastic vote of confidence by the IOC and world sport in South East Queensland and Australia. Mr President, we have a track record of hosting highly successful major international sporting events, Mr President, and that record was critical in the vote for 2032. We know the impact for Sydney, we know the impact for Melbourne, and we look forward to the opportunities Order. for Senator Brisbane Colbeck. and Queensland. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. What benefits will hosting the 2032 Games provide to Queensland and to our nation? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I'm very proud that the Morrison government backed this bid every single step of the way. We did so because we understood the social, the economic benefits for Queensland and the nation are substantial. An assessment by KPMG shows that the 2032 Games will deliver a total benefit of $8.1 billion for Queensland, 17.6 for the rest of Australia. And of course, the considerable focus on sport will help us drive increased levels of participation in sport, improved health, health outcomes for our population, and of course, significant jobs across not only Queensland, but also the rest of Australia, as we build the infrastructure required to support the hosting of the Games in 2032. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Mr Dutton has said, and I quote, anything to incentivise people to get vaccinated, I'm in favour of. Is Mr Dutton right? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Of course, uh, the government has indicated that it will uh, consider targeted incentives at the appropriate time to encourage Australians to get vaccinated, Mr President. But at the current point in time, we have, as we can see in all states, strong demand, strong demand for 
Australians to access a vaccine. Mr President, we have state premiers who are asking for additional vaccine supplies. So, Mr President, uh, Mr Dutton is right. At the appropriate time, the government will consider targeted incentives to targeted groups in support of vaccination. What we won't do, Mr President, what we won't do is a reckless, across the board, more bubble than thought proposal that was pro pro proposed by Mr Albanese last week. Order. Mr President, we will take, we will take, as we've done all the way through the development and the rollout of the vaccination process, appropriate measures to, at the appropriate Order. time, encourage Australians Order. to take up a vaccine. That's been indicated by the head of our COVID-19 vaccination task force. It's been indicated by a number of my colleagues, Mr. President. So we will cont continue to take a considered approach, approach to this. Not some reckless spend billions of dollars exercise to encourage people who have already been vaccinated to take up a vaccine. Why would we do that? Why would the government spend taxpayers' money where people have already taken up the vaccine? We will, con we will continue to operate our rollout on a considered process. Order, Senator Colbeck. Um, Senator Gallagher. Yeah, thank you. I do have question. a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. When asked why he would not consider cash incentives, Mr. Morrison has said, and I quote, "It's not a game show, and I'm not going to pay them off." Can the minister confirm Mr Morrison approached gambling giant Tabcorp in July about the possibility of incentivising the national vaccination rollout with a lottery? Order. I'm going to uh, order. I'm going to remind senators that when people are participating remotely, we need additional extra compliance with the standing order requiring silence. So I can hear the answer, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, no, I can't confirm that. Senator Not Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Vax vaccination rollout, OK. Thank you, Mr President. Um, has the Morrison government now completely ruled out the use of financial incentives to incentivise the vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, what we've ruled... Thank you, Mr President. Thank Senator for the question. Mr President, what we've ruled out is a measure, which irresponsible measure, such as the one proposed by Mr Albanese. We've said that we will, we will consider appropriately targeted measures in support Order. of the vaccine rollout at appropriate times during the vaccine rollout, Mr President. So, uh, Mr President, uh, we will continue, as I've said, to responsibly engage with the Australian people to, to firstly provide them with the opportunity to take up a vaccine and to ensure that they all have that opportunity by the end of this calendar year. Uh, and we are on target to do that, as we've said on a number of occasions, Mr President. Uh, and we will, at the appropriate time, consider targeted measures in support of the vaccine rollout. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister advise the Senate of the social services measures the Liberal and National Government is implementing to support closing the gap? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and uh, thanks Senator Brockman for his question on this really, really important issue for all Australians. The release last week of the first implementation plan was a really important milestone towards closing the gap measures and targets as set out by the National Agreement on Closing the Gap. The plan uh, highlights the real and practical actions that need yeah. to be taken across all governments and, and including, most importantly, across the social services portfolio area. The social services package is a $98 million package across four particular initiatives that will have direct, positive and meaningful impacts on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. One of these measures is $49 million to support states and territories to review and redesign frontline services. The initiative brings together a range of professionals across a wide, wide cross-section of the, of the uh, community 
workers such as social workers, mental health workers, medical professionals, drug and alcohol specialists, domestic violence support services, legal services, financial counsellors, child protection workers, disability support providers, teachers, childcare providers and police to make sure that the support they're providing these families is, uh, is integrated as best it possibly can be. The social services package also includes $38.6 million towards the Outcomes and Evidence Fund to encourage incentive-based uh, and evidence-based service delivery and uh, deliver tangible and improved outcomes to support child and family safety. The new Closing the Gap Outcomes and Targets uh, and the Implementation Plan support embedded cultural competency and trauma responsiveness training in the Indigenous and the non-Indigenous support sector. These new measures go to the heart of the new model of working together under the National Agreement on Closing the Gap and ensure we work towards targets of accountability and genuine Order. partnership. Senator Rustin, Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. How is the government working with Aboriginal community-controlled organisations to address the Closing the Gap targets in out-of-home care and family violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, the only way that we are going to close these gaps and make a difference is if we work together. And that's why we are investing $3.2 million uh, over the next two years to assess the needs and increase the involvement of Aboriginal controlled, uh, community controlled organisations in the child and family uh, support sector. By ensuring that these organisations play a central role in the service uh, provision, we'll improve cultural competency and make sure that it is embedded in all of our child and family services. Through the Outcomes and the Evidence Fund, we will also be providing support proposals that have been identified by Aboriginal community-controlled organisations that address the targets of both out-of-home care and family violence. This will involve a co-design process between these organisations and the government. Not only will they improve support available for Torres Strait, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it demonstrates an absolute commitment to work together to solve this problem. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government working with states and territories to improve the support available for families with complex needs? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Will all governments um, share a responsibility in, in achieving the closing the gap outcomes and improving outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families? And that's why we, as a federal government, are investing $29 million to support states and territories to redesign uh, their frontline services to address the targets, these two very important targets of out-of-home care and family violence. So the redesigned service models will improve how practitioners work together uh, to plan support for families, particularly those families that are at higher risk of interaction with state and territory child protection services. The focus here is on early intervention and ensuring the right support is there for families in an integrated way. We also will be investing $7.7 million over the next three years to develop cultural competency and trauma responsiveness for both the Indigenous and the non-Indigenous child and family workforce. These measures will ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families with complex Order. needs Senator have Rustin. access to services. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. In a few hours, the premier global body on climate science, the IPCC, will warn us that unless there are immediate, rapid and large-scale reductions in pollution from coal, oil and gas, that limiting warning, a warming to even two degrees will be beyond reach and that we will reach dangerous climate tipping points this decade. Will the Morrison government accept the findings of the IPCC and change Australia's disastrous climate policy settings? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Waters for her question. Uh, it is correct, as I understand it, that, uh, that uh, overnight or thereabouts Australian time, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change will release its sixth assessment report, uh, which will provide an update on the latest physical science on climate change, including rates, causes and likely future tra trajectories uh, in relation to uh, climate change. Uh, the, uh, the report, I understand, will be released at 6pm uh, at Australian time. Uh, Australian scientists, uh, as part of Commonwealth contributions, have made significant contributions to the science underpinning the report. Uh, and so, uh, so Mr. Uh, President, uh, our government does look forward to receiving um, 
that report and to its public release uh, and, uh, and to that informing future deliberations, particularly those that will take place uh, at the Glasgow Conference of the Parties uh, later this year. Uh, the, uh, the government, uh, uh, of course, continues, Mr President, uh, to work on, uh, on the pursuit of climate action that is effective, uh, targeted, uh, and particularly targeted on developing the technologies and, that have enabled Australia uh, to be able to meet and exceed our Kyoto targets, Order. our Kyoto 1 target, our Kyoto 2 target, and to put us on track uh, to meet our Paris targets as well. Uh, investing in those technologies enables us, Mr President, uh, to, uh, to not see uh, a tax-based approach, but to see a technology-based approach uh, which has Australia as a world-leading nation when it comes to the adoption of renewable technologies, uh, has Australia as a world-leading nation uh, when it comes uh, indeed uh, to a track record uh, of making commitments, and not just making those commitments, but seeing them through. Uh, and seeing them through and delivering upon them is what is particularly important in that regard. Uh, that's what we're doing in relation to Paris, and it's what we will do in relation to all future commitments as well, Mr. President. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Will your government follow the science and at least double Australia's 2030 targets so they are at levels aligned with the rest of the developed world? Or will you keep Australia on track for four degrees of warming and all of the devastation that comes with that? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, the, uh, the Australian Greens do like to talk down, as always, Australia, and, uh, and they do that in terms of uh, the targets that, uh, that we commit to as a nation as well. Uh, the simple fact is that achieving our 2030 targets will see emissions per capita fall by almost half. See emissions per capita in Australia fall by almost half if we achieve those 2030 targets as we are on track to do so. Uh, emissions per unit of GDP uh, would fall by almost two-thirds under our commitment scenario. So, Mr President, our commitments are significant, uh, and they're significant as well because of our history uh, of emissions reduction and of meeting those targets. Uh, our emissions have fallen by 20 per cent since 2005. We beat our Kyoto-era targets by 459 million tonnes. Between 2005 and 2019, Australia reduced emissions faster than many other nations, Mr President, uh, and will continue to Order. do that Senator through the technology-based approach. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. How much in donations from the coal, oil and gas sector will the Liberal and National parties expect to be able to receive by the end of the decade if the Morrison government continues to refuse to lift its 2030 targets and to put the safety and prosperity of all Australians in peril? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, there comes the, uh, you know, the political question from the Greens, who, uh, who try, to, uh, try to present sincerity on these topics, but then, of course, can't but help uh, to make them uh, politicised, uh, politicised agendas of the Greens. Uh, political donations are published, and they're there on the public record for, uh, for all to see, uh, and, of course, the hypocrisy that comes from the Greens in relation to you know, their historical track record uh, on political donations and happily accepting big donations themselves and so on is equally there on the public record. Uh, for all to see, uh, Mr. President. So we're not going to, uh, to simply take that hypocrisy from the Greens. We're not going to take equally their attacks uh, on the jobs of many Australians uh, in their targeting of different industries and different sectors. What we're investing in are the stretch targets uh, in different industry sectors that will enable Australia to transition in ways that protect Australian jobs, uh, that get emissions down, but also protect the jobs of hardworking Australians across this country uh, and generate new jobs for them in the future. Order. Senator McCarthy. We have Senator McCarthy remotely. Yes, we do should. Yep. Just... Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Does Mr Morrison agree with Mr Fletcher when he asserts that decisions made in relation to the commuter car park program were made on the basis of departmental advice? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I'm, uh, I'm sure that, uh, that the Prime Minister uh, agrees with, uh, with statements made by Minister Fletcher. I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of the full context or direct quote that the Senator is referring to, but, uh, but I know that uh, the Prime Minister has, uh, has 
full confidence in relation to Minister Fletcher, his work and, uh, and his uh, statements. And Mr President, you know, these, projects, uh, these projects that we committed to are all about providing additional support and assistance to Australians, to Australians in terms of going about uh, their daily lives. It's about making sure that uh, infrastructure is there that people want. You know, for example, you know, sort of, I think it's important to look, Mr. President, at you know, what defines some of these projects. To quote, you know, public transport isn't just about the train line or the bus route itself. It's also about the surrounding infrastructure that makes it work for local residents. That's why we are committing to upgrading public parking facilities here at Mango Hill Station and at transport hubs across the country. Now, Mr. President, uh, I, I hear Senator Watt uh, say that uh, it's a marginal seat. Uh, well, uh, well, Mr. President, uh, that quote was from the member for Graindler. The member for Graindler was actually making that quote when he was committing, when he was committing uh, to provide funding for a commuter car park, Mr. President, for a commuter car park as part of the Labor Party's commuter car parks program. Uh, so, Mr. President. Those opposite spelled out the arguments as to why these are worthwhile projects. Those opposite uh, spelled out indeed uh, the fact that under their model, the member for Grainler and others were happy uh, to wander around the country making commitments uh, for these projects. So yes, Mr President, uh, we committed to deliver projects that are beneficial, that are beneficial to people across Australia, uh, and our commitment is to get on with the delivery of those projects as we have been doing for the benefit uh, of people across Australia. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President, did the Prime Minister or his office see the top 20 marginal seats list referred to by the Auditor General in his report? Yes or no? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, the Prime Minister's uh, addressed uh, those questions. Well, he's addressed Order. those questions, Mr. President. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not aware of uh, details around uh, around such things. I am aware, Mr. President, uh, of course, that there are uh, many projects that uh, are currently underway as part of the uh, urban congestion Senator fund. Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. It was. Point of order, direct relevance. It was a very specific question. The Auditor General has, Auditor General has referred to a particular list. The Prime Minister has refused to answer that question. Senator Wong, I would ask I, the pre I, I, I would ask the Minister to return okay, to the I'm, question. I'm going, I, I do grant people who ask questions the opportunity to emphasise the point, but I don't think commentary about the context of the question is appropriate to go into. Um, the minister, in my view, was answering the question. I can't instruct him how to answer it, and I definitely, as I've said before, can't instruct the content of an answer to the precision of words the opposition would prefer or an asker would prefer. Um, it, there are opportunities to debate the content of answers after question time. That's not a matter for points of order. Um, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. As the government's made clear, all decisions regarding commuter car parks were identified based on the demonstrated needs within the community. That was the focus uh, of our government, to make sure we were meeting needs within the community. Uh, and Mr President, I am sure uh, that's what uh, all do in relation to uh, community car park type projects, looking at needs within the community. I'm sure... Order, Senator. Birmingham, I've Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator order, Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. The question goes to whether the Prime Minister or his office saw the list the Auditor General referred to. Um, um, Senator Wong, you've restated the question. I can't, inst I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question. If the can I, I, I'm happy to take a submission, but I'd like to continue to finish what I was saying before I take another submission. I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. If the minister, as I believe he was then doing, was explaining an alternative rationale, I believe that is directly relevant. Senator Wong. Mr President, with, on your ruling, uh, the question did not go to the program that he's now expounding the benefits of. The question went only to whether or not a list had been seen. In my respectful submission, I would ask you to reconsider your ruling, given uh, that, that a discussion of the program itself is directly relevant in accordance with the standing orders, when the only question he is asked, as the man representing the Prime Minister, is whether the list was seen. Um, and the question referred to a list to a list that was referred to by an Auditor General's report. Uh, quite right, and I I believe 
and I'm happy to review the Hansard, and if I'm wrong, I'll come back, as I always do, or approach people individually. But if the, if the minister is explaining a rationale that is directly relevant to that question. Well, I was trying to listen to the minister, and I, 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 I'm, I intend to hear the next 17 seconds of his answer, because he wasn't step making um, comments or observations about alternative policies or the opposition or anything I previously ruled against. Senator Wong. Um, well, Mr President, if I could ask them uh, when you go away and can reconsider Hansard, how it is possible that a discussion of the rationale about funding is directly relevant to a direct question as to whether or not a list has been seen, the opposition would be most grateful for that. I'm advice. happy to review that. Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. They're rather touchy about any comparisons that come up on this program, aren't they? Very, very touchy over there at the fact that, uh, you know, that they were pursuing, of course. Order. Um, Senator Wong. Mr. President, Mr. President, he is he is completely ignoring standing orders. Senator, this is a question about a list. And the question about the list referred to an Auditor General's report which in my view makes an answer about the context of an alternative rationale directly relevant, but I've said I'll review it. Now, it, it, um, well, there were interjections coming across the table. There were breaches of the standing orders going across the table as well. So if there are no interjections, then ministers can't be, can be pulled up for talking about the opposition. But it is relatively um, common in this chamber for people to take disorderly interjections. They won't be taken if they're not made. Senator Birmingham. So, Mr President, the ANO report to the Senate about the Prime Minister's letter of 10 April very clear. It's probably worth just emphasising that, from our perspective, there's nothing unusual about that 10 Order, April correspondence. Order. Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator McCarthy. Senator yes, McCarthy, thanks, a final President. supplementary question. Thank you. Why did the Morrison government vote against providing to the Senate the top 20 marginal seats list and spreadsheets shared between... Mr Tudge's staff, the Prime Minister's office and the department. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, because we're not going to stand for the hypocrisy of those opposite, Mr President. We're not going to indulge their political games and antics, Mr President. That's why uh, we voted uh, in, uh, in that regard in the chamber, Mr President, because the hypocrisy is quite obvious. Uh, take the 2nd of July 2018, when Mr Shorten did a press conference near Gosford Station to announce $15 million for commuter car parks. He was joined by the Labor candidate for Robertson and the Labor member for Dobell. I wonder how those projects were selected, Mr President. Or the 28th of July, when Mr Albanese was at Narangba Station in Queensland with the then member for Longman, Susan Lamb, announcing $5 million. Guess what? That was the day before the Longman by-election. I wonder how that project was chosen by those opposite, Mr President. Or the 27th of October 2018, when Mr Albanese teamed up with Labor Premier Dan Andrews to announce the Tarnay Commuter Park in the lead-up to the 2018 Victorian Order, State Election, Senator Mr Birmingham. President. Order. Order. No, you don't like it, do you? You don't Order. like the comparison. You don't like... Order. 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 Senator Hanson, remotely. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to Minister Birmingham, representing the Minister, the Treasurer. Minister, the Morrison government set up robo-debt to pursue welfare recipients who had been overpaid. In May 2020, the scheme was scrapped and the PM apologised for hurt, harm and hardship caused to people caught up in the automated debt assessment scheme. The total wrongly issued debt sum was $1.2 billion. Minister, last week I questioned you about pursuing those companies and businesses who had been overpaid on JobKeeper claims. What investigation has the government undertaken to ensure taxpayers' monies are accounted for? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson for uh, her question uh, in relation to uh, the JobKeeper program. In relation to, uh, to the uh, final component of Senator Hanson's question about uh, uh, the processes that the tax office uh, undertakes, uh, the tax office uh, has, uh, has a number of data matching and other processes that it deploys to ensure that uh, claims made are valid claims and in accordance with uh, the operations and program guidelines uh, of uh, the JobKeeper scheme that they were administering at the time. Uh, it's important, Mr President, to, uh, to uh, detach 
um, some of the public commentary uh, that, uh, that some have sought to peddle in relation to JobKeeper uh, from what actually those rules and guidelines were. Uh, there's a, a perception that has been painted uh, by some in their public commentary that suggests that any business that ultimately uh, still made uh, a positive financial return uh, through the previous financial year uh, was not eligible for JobKeeper. That's not true. Uh, there were different eligibility criteria, and the first phase of JobKeeper uh, clearly outlined uh, the eligib eligibility criteria built upon expectations of businesses at that time. Uh, and at that time, we were dealing with uh, a nationwide uh, lockdown uh, approach, uh, different businesses being forced to close their doors across the country, uh, and enormous fears that there could be uh, massive levels of unemployment uh, across the country. Uh, that's why JobKeeper was established, and it was established with uh, easy-to-access criteria uh, to deal with uh, the concerns of business at that time. Uh, over subsequent iterations, JobKeeper's criteria uh, was tightened, and of course the ATO has ensured uh, that uh, only those eligible against that tighter criteria received it. Uh, and now we have a different model in terms of the COVID-19 disaster payments and business support models delivered with the states, uh, which provide uh, for even uh, tighter program guidelines. But, uh, Order, uh, Mr. Senator President, I can Birmingham. assure the Senate time that the, the ATO has enforced has the rules expired. at the relevant time. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, you said in your response to me last week, quote, the companies in question were not overpaid. They were eligible under the rules of the program as they operated at the time. Minister, are you aware that companies withheld invoices to receive JobKeeper payments? A lot of companies in doing so paid directors bonuses and shareholders profits at the expense of the taxpayer. Will you investigate? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, anybody who has any evidence of, uh, of any form of, uh, of tax fraud or program or grant fraud uh, should obviously bring that forward. Uh, as I uh, said in relation to the primary uh, question, uh, the Australian Tax Office uh, uh, used its range of powers uh, and data and information uh, to be able to determine eligibility at the different points of the JobKeeper scheme, uh, which, uh, which went through different stages as, uh, as we tightened its eligibility criteria along the way. But in that first phase, uh, it was very much a program uh, designed to be able to intervene rapidly, quickly across the Australian economy and to save jobs. And according to Reserve Bank uh, research, at least 700,000 jobs were saved just in the period April to June last year, that period when the JobKeeper scheme uh, was initially opened up and initially had uh, the widest eligibility criteria at that time to provide certainty and underpinning across the Australian economy, and it did that. It did that effectively, and it saved jobs as a result. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. As I said, you were willing to go after destitute people, people on welfare payments, dependent on welfare, to the tune of 1.2 billion. Why won't you go after big business for what could amount to tens of billions of dollars? If not, the people may assume they are your donors or benefactors. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, I, I reject the insinuation at the end there and, uh, and point out the fact that the Australian Tax Office uh, does go after, to use your words, Senator Hanson, uh, businesses uh, on a routine basis and indeed any other taxpayers on a routine basis where there is any evidence of fraud that the Tax Office undertakes uh, routine uh, audit and compliance activity as well. Uh, and that uh, all of those sorts of activities uh, um, have the potential not just to look at uh, tax fraud, but also uh, in instances to look at the administration of the JobKeeper program as well. Uh, so uh, so I, I would want to assure Senator Hanson that, uh, that enormous effort uh, does occur there, that as a result of their compliance activities, the tax office uh, recoups uh, many billions of dollars for the Australian taxpayer. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, where necessary, takes legal action uh, against those, no matter how big uh, they may be, uh, to, uh, to ensure their compliance with tax rules, grant rules and other things that the ATO administers. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government's plans are supporting Australian women to start their own businesses, getting more women into work and helping to secure their economic future as part of our economic recovery from COVID-19? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. 
Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Chandler for this very important question. Mr President, supporting Australian women to be entrepreneurs, to start a business and to take part in the workforce is a focus of this Morrison government. We know that getting more women into work gives women economic security in life and closes the gender pay gap. Mr President, that's why the Morrison government recently announced it's providing $3.5 million to Grameen Australia. Using its proven models that have worked so well overseas, Grameen will establish and deliver an innovative program to create entrepreneurial opportunities for unemployed women. The program invites participants to join small peer, group, peer support groups and offers mentoring and training and access to loans and savings programs to support them as they establish their own small businesses. Mr President, this initiative will create new self-employment opportunities, will also boost financial literacy and workforce skills for Australian women. Micro-enterprise development allows women to become their own boss, offering flexibility and choice for women who have so much talent and skill to offer in the workforce. And this program specifically will empower women, helping them to build their careers, but it will also provide flow-on benefits to the Australian economy. It's incredibly impressive to see Grameen use innovative measures to help women establish their businesses while also providing wraparound services to ensure that women have the support available to take this very significant step in their working life and in their careers. Mr President, this very exciting new program will initially be, del be delivered in my home state of Victoria in the suburb of Broadmeadows before extending to other locations across Australia. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Mr President, and I thank the Minister for her response. Minister, how many jobs is the program estimated to create and how is women's employment tracking more broadly? Senator Hume. Mr President, the Morrison government's economic plan is clearly delivering, and that is especially so for Australian women. In June, the workforce figures highlighted that more women are in the workforce now than ever before. The women's workforce participation rate is the highest ever recorded in Australia. And the number of women employed has also increased to record levels, and that's now at 6.25 million Australian women. Mr President, what's more, Grameen Australia estimate that this program will create approximately 6,000 new jobs for Australian women just during its first two years alone of operation. This is just one element of this government's women's budget statement, a $3.4 billion package that includes a range of measures designed to remove workforce disincentives for women and increase employment in key industries. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what are the most recent gender pay gap figures and how have they changed over time? Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Again, I thank Senator Chandler for this very important question. I'm extremely glad she asked about changes over time because at present the gender pay gap is at a record low. It's at a record low of 13.4 per cent. Now, Mr President, Australian women know that it is only coalition government policies that drive the gender pay gap lower. When the coalition left government in 2007, the gender pay gap was 15.4 per cent, and it was on its way down. However, when Labor came to government, they oversaw a rise in the gender pay gap. The gender pay gap actually widened as high as 17.4 per cent. That's right. The gender pay gap in Australia went up considerably under a Labor government. And it's taken a coalition government to get this figure back on the right trajectory, heading down once again. And we won't stop here, Mr President, because in the 2021-22 budget we announced a targeted review of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency with the aim of, uh, to push the gender pay gap Order, even Senator lower. Hume. Before I call you, Senator Wong, I just had a message from one of the senators online. Could I ask those senators online to go on to mute? when they're not speaking. Um, there's just occasionally it's picked up and it can be heard by other senators online but not in the chamber. Uh, it's just causing a bit of background interference. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On at least 18 occasions, Mr Morrison has refused to answer questions from the media and in the parliament about whether he tried to get Mr Brian Houston invited to an event hosted by President Trump at the White House. Why? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, uh, I, believe, uh, I believe those issues have been extensively canvassed in estimates and elsewhere, and I don't have anything to add. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Morrison cited national security as a basis for not answering questions from the Senate about the seeking of this invitation. At the time he sought the invitation, was the Prime Minister aware of allegations Mr. Brian Houston concealed child sex offences committed by his father? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Not to my knowledge. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. When did Mr. Morrison last communicate with Mr. Brian Houston? Did Mr. Morrison or any of his ministers have any contact with Mr. Houston about his recent exemption, enabling him to travel overseas? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. To, uh, to my knowledge and understanding, uh, that uh, that exemption was assessed against the defined criteria uh, by uh, by uh, the Australian Border Force through the Home Affairs processes. Any contact? Senator Rennick. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and National Government plans are supporting Australians to gain skills through vocational education and training as a part of our economic recovery from COVID-19? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Rennick for the question. And Mr President, a strong vocational education and training system is critical for Australia's long-term recovery from COVID-19, but also to support our future growth and our future prosperity. As a former skills minister myself, I'm always happy to hear about Australians taking up the opportunities that are presented by vocational education and training in this country. Uh, without a doubt, and certainly from the people I've spoken to, it's a rewarding pathway and it leads to rewarding careers. Mr President, the Morrison government is committed to delivering a world-class vocational education and training system for all Australians. This is a system which will ensure that as a country we have the appropriate skills that we need both now and into the future. Last year, the Morrison government provided the biggest investment into skills funding with almost $6 billion put into skills funding in Australia over the year. This included COVID-19 support measures, including the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees Wage Subsidy, which I'm pleased to advise has helped keep around 140,000 apprentices and trainees in jobs across Australia. Mr President, as we know, in an economic downturn, the first people to go are normally the apprentices and the trainees. But putting in place the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees Wage Subsidy has ensured that we've kept around 140,000 of them on the job, on the tools where we need them to be. As you know, we also partnered with the states and territories and we introduced measures including Job Trainer and the Boosting Apprentices and Trainees Wage Subsidy. This measure is now helping Australians get the skills uh, that they need, but it's also helping Australian employers take on into their businesses a new apprentice or trainee. Again, it's all about giving us the skills Order. we need. Senator, Cash. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. How is the government's Boosting Apprenticeship and Trainee Commencement Wage Subsidy working to deliver more apprentices and trainees for businesses across Australia? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government's Boosting Apprentices and Trainees Commencement Wage Subsidy, which was introduced, as we know, last year, has already supported over 180,000 apprentices and trainees across Australia. Mr President, that's 180,000 Australians who are now in apprenticeships and traineeships or traineeships as a result of the wage subsidy that the Morrison government put in place. In terms of the wage subsidy itself, it's 50 per cent wage subsidy, up to $7,000 per quarter, and a business is able to access this subsidy right up until March 2022, so that's March next year. They can take on a new apprentice or trainee, access the wage subsidy, and then they get that for a 12-month period. Again, this is all about putting in place those policies which enable employers who are seeking to bring on a new apprentice or trainee into their business, giving them the Order. ability Senator to do Cash, just that. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. How is the government's investment in the Job Trainer Fund helping Australians reskill and upskill into new opportunities? 
Senator Cash. And again, Mr President, last year the Morrison government, as I've said, partnered with state and territory governments and we established the $1 billion job trainer fund. The Commonwealth government provided half a billion dollars and this was matched by contributions from state and territory governments. The initial investment will provide over 300,000 additional training places and, Mr President, these are free or low fee, and the key to the success of job training is that we worked with the states and the territories to ensure that these places are in identified areas of labour market demand. So, for example, health, age and disability care, IT and trades for job seekers and for young people, including school leavers. And then again, as part of the 2021-22 budget, the Australian government announced it would commit a further half a billion dollars, again to be matched by the states and territories, and we are now expanding the Job Trainer Fund by 163,000 places. Senator Cash. Senator much, Mr. President, and my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. How many residential aged care workers have tested positive to COVID-19 this year? How many aged care residents have been hospitalised with COVID-19 this year? And how many have tragically died? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Senator, you're on mute. Senator Colbeck, are you? Do you need to unmute yourself? I did work. Thank you, Mr. President. There, there are a number of elements to that, uh, to that question, Mr. President, and I don't have the number of re, uh, aged care workers who were positive at the 30th, uh, at the end of December last year. So, to give you a number going backwards, I'm not able to do at the moment, Mr. President. Um, in order, Senator. Uh, um, Senator Colbeck, the question was how many residential aged care workers have tested positive to COVID-19 this year? Okay. I, I, I allow, because we are remotely, I'll allow you to restate that. I, he has been speaking very briefly, so I'm listening very carefully. It was a very factual question, so I'll call the minister to continue. Yeah, yes, Mr. President, I have, I have the total number of infections of aged care workers through the pandemic, but I don't have the number at the end of December last year, so I can't give you a number at the end of December. Uh, so I can't give you the difference, Mr. President. But across the pandemic, there have been 2,278 staff who've been infected with uh, COVID-19. Uh, as of today, in New South Wales, there are 33 workers who have contracted the, the virus, uh, Mr. President. And tragically, there have been two deaths in aged care. One, the recipient, a home care recipient, who, um, from what my, the advice that I have, uh, contracted the virus from a family member. Order, uh, Senator and, Coleman, and Senator one... O'Neill on a point of order. Um, po point of order, Mr. President. I am pleased that Minister Colbeck has been able to deliver some okay, Senator, numbers, but he is not answering the, the questions that have been asked, which were very specific. There, the, the claim is on a point of relevance. There, there, there are interesting facts, but they are not facts that answer the question well, that was asked. I'm, I am not. While the minister is actually talking specifically about numbers, and he outlined at the beginning of it why he can't answer it in the terms you requested. I am reluctant to rule out a minister who is specifically talking about infections and unfortunate deaths of staff and residents. Um, I've allowed you to restate the question. There's an opportunity to debate the merits of the question afterwards, but I believe the minister is very narrowly confining himself to the information he has at hand, and he is therefore directly relevant. Senator, Senator O'Neill. President, just indicate that the questions are specific because there is information that we seek, and while I'm interested in what the minister has to say, because it is a matter of such import. If the minister can't answer this question, well, he really should take Senator, it on notice and Senator, provide Senator us with O'Neill, the correct again, facts. Again, Senator O'Neill, I allow some flexibility in people, particularly remotely, being able to restate the question. I say again, 
There is an opportunity to debate the merits of the answer and whether something should be taken on notice or otherwise after question time. The minister is very narrowly confining himself to the facts he has at hand, and in fact he went at the start to explain why he couldn't answer it in the terms requested. These facts, I believe, are directly relevant to the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And as, so, so there's been one recipient of home care who has tragically passed away, and uh, all our condolences go to the family of that person, uh, Mr President. And there has been one recipient uh, or one, one person who lives in residential aged care who has passed away. And again, our condolences to that person's family. Uh, that person was an unvaccinated resident of a residential aged care facility in Sydney who died in recent days. Uh, Mr. President, and I will take the details of the other information on notice and report that back to the chamber. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Morrison committed that all aged care workers would be fully vaccinated by Easter. Why have only 36 per cent of aged care workers been fully vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and we've been through this a number of times in the chamber now. Uh, when the Prime Minister made that commitment, the intention of the government was to vaccinate the workforce and the residents at the same time, Mr. President. We did, however, take the health advice, which, which came from evidence out of other jurisdictions, other countries around the world. That it was not safe to do that, Mr. President. So, based on that advice, we were forced to change the way that we were vaccinating the workforce. Mr. President, we continue to provide opportunities for the workforce to get vaccination. We continue to focus our attention on doing that, Mr. President. And as Senator O'Neill quite rightly says, 36.6% of the aged care residential workforce have received full vaccination. 56.8% had our first expired. Dose. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, will Mr Morrison take responsibility for failing to establish national quarantine and bungling the vaccine rollout, which has left vulnerable older Australians in residential aged care at risk of COVID-19? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I reject the assertions made by Senator O'Neill. Um, her blatant politicisation of the vaccine rollout and the Labor Party's blatant politicisation of the vaccine rollout has done nothing, done absolutely nothing for the confidence in the national program. And you could say that the Labor Party have been deliberately attempting to undermine this process all the way through, Mr President. Of course, the government takes responsibility for making available Order. vaccines to Australians across the country. And we uh, have reinforced and re reaffirmed that responsibility on a number of occasions. Uh, and we continue to adapt the rollout to meet the immediate concerns and to provide more opportunities for Australians to access a vaccine as soon as possible. We have said we'd like every Australian who wants a vaccine to have one by the end of the year. And we're well and well and truly Order, on target Senator to Colbert, meet that. Time for the answer to expire. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister please advise the Senate of the programs that our government has delivered to assist communities and in individuals to recover from the uh, previous crisis we had, which was the 2019-20 Black Summer bushfires? including the support in my home state of New South Wales. Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Senator Davey, uh, for your question and for your long-standing support for regional New South Wales. The Black Summer bushfires were one of the most devastating natural disasters we've seen in our nation's history. And in such a time of desperation and loss, Australians came to do, together to do whatever they could to assist these affected communities. Our government is committed to standing side by side with communities as they recover from these devastating bushfires. And through the National Bushfire Recovery Fund and other bushfire recovery assistance, we've provided support to address immediate recovery needs. 
To date, $2.8 billion of Commonwealth support has been made available for recovery, and 85 per cent of that has been delivered. This includes $1.7 billion delivered from the National Bushfire Recovery Fund, supporting locally-led efforts on the ground because we know that locals know what's best for their community. Significant immediate assistance has been provided, including nearly 5,000 bushfire damaged and destroyed properties being cleared, over 200,000 disaster recovery payments made to individuals, over 88,000 uh, payments of $400 to assist with back-to-school expenses for families, over 27,000 grants and loans provided to small businesses and primary producers, and finances, financial assistance provided to 3,200 uh, volunteer firefighters. Of the numerous programs included under the National Bushfire Recovery Fund, one of the largest is the $700 million local economic recovery program being delivered in partnership uh, with state governments. Nearly 400 successful projects have been announced to date, with more to come. In your home state of New South Wales, up to $2.4 million will construct a new multi-purpose community facility in the Upper Lachlan Shire New Visitors Information and Community <coughs> Centre. The facility will ad deliver additional services to the local community. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Can the minister also explain what support is currently available for those communities who are still recovering from these devastating bushfires. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, as part of the, as part of the Liberal and Nationals government commitment, uh, the $280 million Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants program builds on measures implemented by the government over the past 18 months to support disaster response, relief, and recovery in bushfire-affected areas. Projects can be funded between $20,000 and $10 million for community organisations, local councils and businesses. This program will help bushfire-impacted communities build back better and funds a lot of those recovery and resilience projects. Amounts identified for each eligible local government area in the grant guidelines are a guide. They are not fixed or capped. I want to make that very, very clear. Um, it is the size of the local government area is not a limiting factor uh, under this program. A committee chaired by the Coordinator General, Gen General of the NRRA will undertake a detailed assessment of the applications based on eligibility and merit. It will then be to me to Order, then be Senator the final McKenzie. decision Senator maker. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. How is our government working to build our resilience? Senator Not McKenzie. only for bushfires, oh, but for emergencies and national disasters more broadly and into the future. My apologies, Could Senator you? McKenzie. <laughs> well, but she loves the arts, does Senator Dave. That was a great dramatic pause. But Australians are too familiar with the devastation caused by natural disasters such as bushfires, floods and droughts. These types of events are inevitable. Uh, many hazards are becoming more frequent and intense. We are progressing towards a much more resilient and prepared country. And the Liberal and Nationals in government are driving a comprehensive program of measures in partnerships with states and territories to realise the outcomes of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework and increase that resilience of Australian communities. The framework outlines a coordinated approach to reducing disaster ri risk and its implementation will be supported by the first National Action Plan. Australian and state governments have committed $261 million over the next five years uh, to work out the priorities of the framework and, in addition, the Australian Climate Service, comprising of the Bureau of Meteorology, the CSIRO, um, the ABS and Geoscience Time for the Australia has, has been expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Colbeck, I understand, seeking the call. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, just to uh, give details of the number of uh, Australians in ICU, as of 12 p.m. today, there are 70 people in ICU, uh, 29 on ventilation, 67 in New South Wales, one in Queensland, one in South Australia, and one in Western Australia. Uh, and to update the chamber on the number of lives lost this year, with some the, the latest data that I've received, uh, 30 lives have been lost in Australia this year to COVID, and 941. Uh, in total um, through the pandemic. And of course, Mr. President, 
our thoughts are to all of those families who have um, lost a loved one as a result of that circumstance of, uh, of COVID, Mr. President. Um, and to add to the information that I gave in relation to staff cases, um, Mr. President, um, there have been, there were uh, 2,238 staff cases in uh, 2020, and so uh, aligning that number with the figure that I gave you for the latest number of staff cases uh, would give you the number of cases this year. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Colby. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Birmingham and Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Wong, Chisholm, O'Neill and Gallagher. For a long time, we've known we have a Prime Minister who doesn't take responsibility, who blames others, who's full of excuses, who's addicted to secrecy and allergic to the truth. We've seen it over and over again in car park rorts, in sports rorts, in his disappearance to Hawaii in the middle of the bushfires. And sadly, we've even seen these character flaws in relation to some of the most serious criminal allegations possible involving sexual offences against children. For several years, it has been a matter of public record that one of the Prime Minister's closest friends, his pastor and mentor, Brian Houston, has been accused of a grave crime, that of concealing evidence of child sex offences committed by his father, former pastor Frank Houston. In October 2015, the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse found that Brian Houston had failed to report allegations of child sexual abuse by his father and facilitated a payment to the alleged victim that he failed to disclose to the church. Despite these allegations, as long ago as October 2015, the Prime Minister has showered his friend, the alleged criminal Mr Houston, with praise. Just this year, at a conference in April, the Prime Minister publicly thanked Mr Houston for his ongoing personal support. But along the way, the Prime Minister has been his usual evasive, shifty, fork-tongued self over his intervention to have Mr Houston invited to an official event at the White House under President Trump. The same Mr Houston, who has now been charged with concealing child sexual offences and who has been given a travel exemption to leave the country by Mr Morrison's government. Who can forget the Prime Minister dodging questions about his intervention for Mr Houston for months on end? The quotes over and over at press conferences both in the United States and in Australia. I don't comment on gossip. I don't feel the need to comment on those things. I don't comment on unsourced reports. That's a matter for the White House. Even inventing national security and international relations grounds to avoid scrutiny on this legitimate topic. In total, the Prime Minister refused to answer questions about his intervention to assist Mr Houston attend the event at the White House 18 times. In total, the Prime Minister, his ministers and government refused to answer questions about this legitimate topic for a total of 43 times. And of course, this was all before finally, grudgingly, the Prime Minister admitted that his office had asked for Mr Houston to be invited to the event at the White House, even though he knew of the allegations against Mr Houston, which had been public for at least five years. Why can't this Prime Minister just tell the truth? It's because he is a slippery politician who never takes responsibility and never gives straight answers. Even today, the government's discomfort with the Prime Minister was plain to see in the answers from Senator Birmingham. When asked why the Prime Minister had refused to say 18 times whether he had intervened to assist Mr Houston, Senator Birmingham's response, I have nothing to add. The national security excuse, not to my knowledge. He didn't even answer when the Prime Minister last communicated with Mr Houston. That's how much Senator Birmingham knows that this topic is something that the government doesn't want to talk about. 
Now, some in the government have tried to characterise these questions, both from Labor and the media, as an attack on the Prime Minister's religion, and nothing could be further from the truth. What it's about is the, is the character of a Prime Minister who sought to invite a man accused of concealing child sexual offences to an official function at the White House. What it's about is the character of a Prime Minister who denied it, who dodged it and ducked it for months. What it's about is the character of a Prime Minister who, when finally found out, dismissed the issues involving child sexual offences as, quote, not that big a deal. What it's about is a Prime Minister who never takes responsibility, never gives straight answers, blames others, is full of excuses, who refuses to answer legitimate questions and who covers up at every opportunity about car park rorts, sports rorts and even about his intervention to assist a man accused of concealing child sexual offences. Australians are fast working out this Prime Minister and they don't like Thank what you, they Senator see. Senator Watt, your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Acting Deputy President, um, uh, rather, Madam Deputy President, um, and I rise to take note today of answers to questions concerning Australia's vaccines rollout program and the COVID-19 crisis. And these are incredibly important issues that our country faces. And it is a pleasure to be able to stand here and talk about what the government is doing in this regard. Because, Madam Deputy President, we do find ourselves more than a year and a half into a global pandemic that has changed the world as we once knew it. In that time, every nation and every government has faced a constantly evolving set of challenges to keep citizens safe and, as far as possible, keep the economy moving forward. And certainly, um, when I've previously uh, spoken in Take Note debate on these issues, I have focused on the unprecedented nature of the COVID-19 crisis and the way that government has had to adapt to the crisis as it has it's changed and the way that it has impacted on our country and on our society and individuals within it has changed. Madam Deputy President, no government in the world would claim, I think, to have got everything right over the last couple of years. And, and I think that that most likely includes uh, every government in Australia, both state and federal. But we must keep looking forward and moving towards the goals which will prevent Australians dying and being hospitalised from this awful illness and allow us to reopen our economy and our small businesses and our communities. And that's why it is so important, Madam Deputy President, that the vaccine rollout continues to ramp up and be extended to more and more Australians who are eager to do their bit and get the jab. And certainly that is what we are seeing across the country at the moment. And that is something that I think we should all be proud of. More than 13.5 million vaccine doses have now been administered, and we are well over the mark of hitting more than a million doses administered every week. And I think that is great news, and I'm sure many Australians are happy to hear that. A total of 4.5 million vaccinations were given in July, which is more than double that achieved in May uh, when 2.1 million doses were ad administered, which I think was um, most likely the last time I was uh, in here taking note on this exact same topic, Madam Deputy President. Um, I'm pleased to say that my home state of Tasmania is leading the way amongst Australian states in getting the population vaccinated with over 50 per cent having had their first dose, and that was certainly a milestone that I think will be celebrated in Tasmania uh, at the moment. It is clear from the daily numbers that are coming in that Australians continue to remain eager to get the jab, and those numbers of Australians who are fully vaccinated is going to continue to climb. And certainly, Madam Deputy President, when I speak to young Australians, um, about getting the vaccine. They are enthused for when um, the opportunity arises for them, whether that's uh, waiting for Pfizer or indeed uh, having conversations with their GP about the possibility of getting AstraZeneca. Young Australians certainly want to do our bit uh, to help our country get through the COVID-19 crisis. And, and I think um, see the, those restrictions start to uh, come away and we return back to normal. This is exactly what we want to see. Uh, the national plan to tr transition Australia's COVID-19 response has been agreed in principle at National Cabinet, and that is a really important part of charting the pathway forward for us to get back to situation normal. It shifts the focus from continued suppression of community transmission to post-vaccination settings focused on prevention of serious illness and fatalities where the public health management of COVID-19 becomes consistent with other infectious diseases. 
The plan consists of four phases, with the success of one stage and movement into the next determined um, when meeting vaccine thresholds at both a state and national level. And this is based on scientific and economic modelling conducted for the COVID-19 risk analysis and response task force. Madam Deputy President, we as a government are taking a clear, methodical and science-based response to COVID-19. The way we get there, uh, getting back to situation normal, being able to ease these social restrictions, seeing the days of border, um, border restrictions gone and lockdowns gone is by continuing with the rollout of the vaccine. And Australians continue to show their willingness to get vaccinated against the virus. They understand that getting vaccinated isn't just about protecting themselves. In fact, it's about protecting their family and their local community. This is the only way that our lives will return to some sense of normality where extended lockdowns are a thing of the past and where we don't need to worry about interstate borders being closed at a moment's notice. We know how tough it is for so many Australians right now who are enduring lockdowns and I certainly thank hope you, to Chandler, thank you, Senator Chandler, your Senator. time has expired. Uh, Senator Green. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I am joining the Senate today in lockdown in Cairns. Uh, we have just gone into um, a three-day lockdown, which started yesterday, uh, due to a case of um, the Delta variant here in Cairns. Um, so this community knows more than more than most about the ups and downs of lockdowns, how it affects the local economy, uh, and now we are in our own lockdown uh, dealing with these issues. Um, but it was interesting to see the questions uh, asked and answered by um, uh, the Minister, Minister Colbeck today, because what's clear is uh, we have headed down a path, we have turned around and we're headed down a path that we're not coming out of anytime soon. Uh, we asked questions and we expected answers about how many Australians were in hospital, how many Australians have died and how many Australians are in ICU at the moment. And it is incredibly disappointing uh, and it, it really shows a, an extreme level in, of incompetence that the minister was not able to answer those questions without taking them on notice. We know that there are 62 Australians in ICU and 371 Australians in hospital right now with COVID-19. And so it is galling to see members of the government stand up and talk about how successful the vaccine rollout has been, how good a job that they are doing, how Australians should be happy to not be somewhere else or in another country, uh, because we have Australians who are dying. We have Australians who are in ICU. We have Australians who are in hospital. We have cities around the country in lockdown, businesses closing and workers losing their jobs. It reminds me of what the government was doing last year to prepare for this vaccine rollout. Uh, we know that Australia is uh, 35th in the OECD when it comes to vaccinations. Uh, we rank behind countries like Iceland, Chile, the UK, France, Lithuania, Czech Republic, Colombia and Mexico behind all of those countries and more. That's where Australia's vaccine rollout is up to. Uh, but what the government did last year was roll out an advertising campaign. I'm sure a lot of senators will remember hearing members uh, from the government talk about their comeback and how Australia was on a path of comeback. Um, you could almost play bingo when every time you heard it in, a, in a, um, a question from the government. And they spent $15 million on this advertising campaign to talk about what a good job they were doing, what a great job the government was doing and how Australia was about to come back from COVID-19. And yet here we are after $15 million of advertising in papers around the country and we are back in lockdowns because the government failed to do its job instead of advertising about how good it is and actually just deliver the vaccines that Australians need. We know that many people in the 1B phase of vaccinations still are yet to receive a vaccine. We know that aged care workers, disability workers, and yes, people who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have not received the vaccine, although they are in the 1B phase. 
This government is happy to take credit, but never capable of taking responsibility or accepting the blame when they are in the wrong. They're happy to put advertising throughout the country telling people how good a job they've done, but they couldn't put advertising to tell people when their vaccine appointment would be available because they didn't have enough vaccines to supply the country. And finally, I just want to address some of the government uh, um, comments about uh, about Labor talking down the vaccine program. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. And yet, when you have a look at the Facebook pages of uh, backbench senators and um, people in the other place from this government, what we have seen is anti-mask, anti-lockdown, anti-vax rhetoric from members of this government. So if the government wants to talk about people who are talking down this country, talking down the vaccinations, then they need to start with their own back bench because nobody is going to take this government seriously on vaccinations until it accepts responsibility and, to, and make sure that people in its own government are doing the right thing and delivering the right message. Australians expect so much more and yet this government is failing every single test. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. There really have been two uh, key moments, uh, at least in, in my lifetime, that have you know, shaped uh, the course of history and the, or the, you know, shaped our, our lives and, and the future of our lives and the way we live. The first, of course, uh, was September 11 and the impact that that had uh, upon our society. Uh, upon the way that we uh, go about life, and importantly, we noticed it uh, when we when we travel uh, before uh, before September 11. Uh, I remember my very first plane ride. I was actually 18 when I first uh, hopped on an aeroplane. Uh, I was from Perth to Adelaide, and uh, my friend uh, uh, said, "Well, you should try to go up the front of the cockpit and uh, and and sit with the pilot." And so we arranged for that to happen. And I it was because of those days, you could you could do that. You could go. Uh, up the front of the plane, and uh, uh, but of course after September 11, they, they put uh, they, they put in place the uh, the necessary security protocols to, to deal with it. Uh, when we uh, we go through airports now, there, there's a big change, uh, and this pandemic has been a, another significant pivotal moment uh, for for the world uh, as we're dealing with the COVID pandemic. Uh, it was uh, if you'd described some of the conditions that we're now living under with lockdowns, uh, with uh, uh, dealing with uh, mass uh, changes to the way that we go about our lives, uh, our, our freedoms. Uh, no one uh, could have imagined what we're dealing with because these are unprecedented times. These are life-changing, uh, altering times for, uh, for us as a, as a society and as a, as a global population indeed. And so these have been incredibly challenging times, and this government uh, has had to work with that and adapt where necessary. Adapt where necessary. We've, uh, one of the important things to do uh, was uh, once the, the vaccines were, were uh, announced as, as being successful uh, back in somewhere around July of last year, uh, this government stepped up and negotiated with. Uh, the providers of those vaccines that were known at the time to be viable and be, uh, to have the potential to be able to be rolled out across Australia. And we dealt with it at, in, in the circumstances at that time, negotiating with uh, the various providers of those vaccines, including one that was uh, potentially going to be developed and, and available here within Australia in partnership with the uh, University of, of Queensland. And we found, uh, after further testing of that, making sure that there was thorough testing, uh, that that vaccine uh, wasn't going to be viable due to the, uh, due to the, the circumstance around the um, uh, providing uh, inaccurate uh, uh, testing results for uh, HIV, which, which was inaccurate. And of course, that stunted the, the ability to be able to roll out that vaccine. But the government adapted and moved uh, along with those necessary changes. And, uh, and this is the, the hallmark of this government, is you've got to be able to react uh, to the circumstances, to the changes that are, that are there, uh, and adapt to that so that you can appropriately uh, see the rollout uh, get, across, uh, get across the country. 
And we are seeing the rollout take up significant pace now. Now, I want to just draw attention to what's happening in, in Western Australia right now. Uh, Western Australia, you know, my home state, uh, we've dealt uh, with the COVID pandemic uh, arguably better than, than anywhere else uh, in the country and better than anywhere else in the world. Uh, we've experienced very, very uh, few instances of where we've had to lock down. While we've had a few lockdowns, we've ultimately been able to transgress through this COVID pandemic and we're able to see uh, businesses are, are thriving and the resource sector, of course, is, uh, is delivering great uh, economic returns for the country. But sadly, I think uh, maybe it's because of the success and we're a victim of that success, the vaccine rollout in Western Australia is the lowest in the country. Now, I'm not blaming Western Australians, uh, but I do understand it because when I speak to family and friends and people in the community, uh, you know, when I talk to them about taking out the vaccine and taking the opportunity to go and get it, many of them are, are, are not rushing to do it because uh, you know, it's, it's, not front, it's not front of mind for them. It's not uh, necessarily uh, in their face. And I just want to encourage uh, Western Australians. Uh, we've led the way in, in many aspects of this COVID kind of pandemic. Let's not, uh, let's not uh, lose the way in not making sure that we hit those vaccine targets before Christmas. We certainly don't want to see uh, other states beat us to it. And I know that Western Australians, they're parochial and they'll rise to the challenge. And I just want to encourage you to get out there, make a booking. It's easy to do. It's simple to do. You've got the opportunity to do it. And uh, I oh, encourage you to sorry, do it. Sorry, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, your time's expired. Um, yes, uh, I think we now have Senator Marielle Smith on remote. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, wasn't that an uncomfortable, although not unfamiliar, silence we had from Minister Colbeck? this afternoon in question time in failing to answer what can only be called very basic, very factual questions about the vaccination rollout, about the number of people who have been impacted by COVID this year, about the death from COVID. It, it is just staggering, absolutely staggering. Senator Chisholm was asking about the number of deaths of Australians since the start of the year. He was asking about the number of Australians in ICU. And in response, silence, silence for moments and moments and moments, as once again, Minister Colbeck couldn't answer the most basic of factual questions on this pandemic. Now, these are hardly gotcha questions. It's hardly an attempt at a gotcha moment, right? Basic factual questions, but an astonishing silence that has come to characterise his performance in question time on this topic, his performance in this place. We've got almost half the country in lockdown, New South Wales entering its seventh week in lockdown, my state having been locked down, Cairns going into lockdown now. And what's the pathway out? What's the pathway from this government out of this mess? We know we need to get to somewhere like 70, 80 per cent of vaccination across Australia if we're going to start to see the end of lockdowns. And the way the Prime Minister's patting himself on the back, you'd think we were close to that. But let's look at some facts. As of the 7th of August, only just over 22% of the population over 16 has had both vaccines. In South Australia, that's, that's even lower. We're not anywhere near the vaccination rate we need to be if we're gonna see an end to these lockdowns. These lockdowns, which more than half the country are experiencing or have experienced in recent weeks, including in my home state of South Australia. Millions of Australians left exposed and vulnerable to the Delta strain in particular because they haven't been able to access jabs in arms. And disproportionately, younger people with much lower rate of vaccination who are often out there doing essential work, it may not be characterised as essential for the purposes of their access to vaccination, but it is essential work because it has to continue. Many of those are young people who are also vulnerable from this strain, from this variant. They've already suffered disproportionately because of this pandemic. And now more so, they are desperate to see their lives return to normal. But until they have both shots of a vaccination, they cannot. The government has bungled this. 
The government has bungled the vaccination rollout just as a bungled hotel quarantine. And Minister Colbeck stood in Parliament today, not only unable to answer the most basic factual questions, but he had the audacity to accuse Labor of attempting to politicise the vaccination rollout. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. Labor has every right to ask you questions about this rollout. That's not politicising it. That's holding you to account. That's our job. That's our job. And we have to because you've bungled it. And if you want to talk about politicising the rollout, if you want to talk about politicising vaccines, a little self audit of the Facebook pages of your backbenchers wouldn't go astray. It wouldn't go astray because if there's anyone <coughs> politicising the vaccination rollout, it is not Labor senators. It is people on your own side, on your own backbench, on their Facebook pages in the public domain. That's where the problem is of politicisation. And rather than focus on us, you should be focused on fixing the bungled vaccine rollout, the bungled hotel quarantine system, and the mess we're in at the moment where far too many Australians are standing ready and waiting to get a vaccination, but are unable to access it. They're unable to access it. That's where your focus should be. That's where your attention should be. And by Labor senators asking you the most basic and factional questions about where that process is up to, you should be able to answer that when you come into question time. The most basic level of ministerial accountability. So perhaps be able to do that before you start attacking us. Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, <clears throat> the question is that uh, the Senate take note of um, the motion as moved by Senator Watt. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, sorry, <laughs> Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the responses to my questions about the IPCC report, which is due tonight, which will send the strongest alarm yet that this is the critical decade. 2030 is what counts, and delay is the new denial. Australia's only remaining allies in global climate forums are Russia and Saudi Arabia. And our nation is locking in with petrostates because of the power the influence, the donations and the job offers of coal and gas companies, the job offers to politicians once they leave this chamber. The US, the UK, the EU, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand have all lifted their 2030 targets in recent months, but the Morrison government is prioritising the profits of coal and gas donors over the safety and well-being of all Australians. And this isn't just about future generations anymore. The impacts of the climate crisis are being felt already. Our bushfires the summer before last. Athens and the west coast of the US are now facing similar devastating and terrifying fires. Europe is flooding. The islands of the Torres Strait are already feeling salt water, salt water incursion into their food producing lands. What the IPCC report tells us is that we're going to exceed 1.5 degrees of warming this decade unless we radically reduce pollution. The other half of the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef uh, will be non-existent under 1.5 degrees. We know that we lose 90 per cent of global coral reefs under 1.5 degrees and virtually all of them under a 2 degree scenario. Australia is one of the most exposed countries in the world to climate damage and we've already warmed by 1.4 degrees. Abares just told us that climate change has already cost every Australian farmer $30,000 a year on average so far. And that is just the beginning as droughts, floods and heat waves wreak havoc on our continent. Failure to lift our 2030 targets is criminal negligence. There is no longer any excuse. If we don't act this decade, we're putting our lives and our kids' lives directly at risk. The number one priority for government is to keep people safe. And the Morrison government is roundly failing in that duty. And what is most galling about this is that they're prioritising the coal and gas donors that the Australian Tax Office has described as systemic non-payers of tax. 
They're prioritising that mob ahead of the lives and the safety of all Australians. The IPCC report uh, due to be released tonight will tell us what scientists have been telling us for some time, which is that action now matters much more than whatever we might pledge to do in 2050. That will be too late. There is nowhere left for Scott Morrison and for the Labor Party, I might add, to hide. We need strong, science-based 2030 targets. Rebuilding our energy system and creating the physical and social infrastructure that we need to stop runaway global warming will require the creation of hundreds of thousands of jobs right around this country. For every one coal or gas job in Australia, there are 16 jobs that require a stable climate, from agriculture to tourism to winemaking. Taking urgent action to address the climate crisis makes sense on every single measure for our survival, for job creation, for the preservation of nature. This government are so blinded by the fossil fuel donations and the promises of lucrative jobs post-politics that they dish out $11 billion in fossil fuel subsidies to their coal, oil and gas donor mates. They have pathetic targets that aren't based on science that they then use dodgy accounting to try to claim that they're meeting and they sell us all out. How many more scientific reports will this government ignore with impunity? Time is running out. We have one job here as this parliament. And this government has one job, is to keep people safe and to act in the public interest. At the minute, the scientists are in the bin. The government's got their hand out to get more donations from the coal, oil and gas sector, and they are imperilling us all. How dare you? as Greta Thunberg famously said, how dare you risk our collective future for the sake of your own self-aggrandisement and your own self-enrichment. Um, for heaven's sake, start putting the science at the centre of your decision-making. Please listen tonight at six o'clock when the IPCC delivers its strongest warning yet, and please change the course of your pathetic climate policy, or get out of the way and let other people like the Greens do the Thank job. Thank you, Senator Waters. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, are there any notices of motion?